Second, you understand how important listening is because everything that's important is happening at several removes from you. And if you don't understand how organizations work, you know, the, one of the important things to understand is organizations are not structured to provide robust information to their leader. In fact, organizations are structured to prevent that flow of, of, of information, particularly bad information. This is the Leadership Foundry Podcast. I'm your host this week, Brandon Smith. And our guest this week is the former chairman and CEO of the Home Depot, Frank Blake. I I was thrilled with my conversation with Frank, not only to have him on the show, but his insights and wisdom was absolutely enlightening. So many things that he learned as a CEO and leader, I I think are not being practiced today. So I really want you to hone in on a couple points. Frank spent a lot of time reframing the organization. So when we think as a CEO and senior team, we often think, oh, everyone's going to bring us information and we're going to make decisions. It's all going to trickle down. He said, no, 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 no. We learned early on at Home Depot uh, something that was preached by Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank, the inverted pyramid. The leaders are at the bottom and the organization is all the way to support the customers who are at the top. He says, when you think of it that way, you realize there's a lot of gravity to everything you do, it's pulling things back. So you have got to push harder to get the information. That theme is gonna run through our entire conversation. So I really want you to hone in on some of his leadership lessons because whether you're a new manager or, or a new CEO or a member of a senior team, the things that Frank offers us are absolutely golden and will help you and your teams starting tomorrow. So take lots of notes, I did. And of course, stay tuned to my summary at the very end. Frank, so excited to have you on the show here today. So excited to hear a little bit more, not only about your leadership journey, uh, but your leadership insights that you've had along the way. So so I, uh, most listeners who are listening to the show, I, I'm sure in some way or another are familiar with you. But for that rare listener that may not know you, uh, maybe a good starting place. Can you share a little bit about your your career journey? And then we can jump into some of those big lessons that you've learned along the way. All right. Well, uh, first off, Brandon, it's it's great to join you on this podcast. And uh, as you'll see a little bit from my own journey, I am a deep believer in leadership being something that can be learned uh, because it's certainly something that I learned over the course of my career. And I think uh, discussions like yours are hugely helpful for that. So by way of background for your listeners, uh, I'm a lawyer by training. I started my life as uh, a lawyer in Washington, D.C., basically moving between public service and private practice of law. So I was privileged uh, to work for George Bush dad uh, when he was vice president. I served in the Reagan administration and I also served uh, in George Bush uh, son's administration. I was the deputy secretary of energy for uh uh, POTUS 43. The 41 is the dad, 43 is the son. Uh, learned a lot from that and uh, built up a practice, a private practice in Washington, D.C. that was pretty significant. And then decided uh, in 1990 to leave private practice and go and work at GE, which people mm-hmm. thought was an odd choice because I left to go be the general counsel and the power systems business in Schenectady, New York, which as far as Washington, D.C. was concerned, it might not be the end of the world, but you could see it from there. So (laughs) it was like, why are you going to Schenectady? Anyway, uh, I was uh, the general counsel of this power systems business. And as I joke, I was the beneficiary of GE's HR practices because GE would this was during the time of Jack Welch? They'd rotate leaders every 18 months or so. You wouldn't rotate a lawyer because you know this was you wouldn't bother to take the TE hit for traveling expense hit for rotating the lawyers. So I'm in position and at, for years, and after about the fifth or sixth year, uh, I find myself sitting around the table and I know more about the business than a lot of business people, and uh. I got the chance to move on to the business side and did mostly M&A activity 
for the power systems business, ran a couple of small uh, P&L, but mostly did uh, M&A. And then I got a promotion and went to uh, corporate headquarters, Fairfield, and was a direct report to Welch uh, as doing M&A for all of GE. Uh, then a uh, short stint in government and the Department of Energy. And one of the people I worked for at GE lost out in the succession race to Jack, Bob mm-hmm. Nardelli, became the CEO of Home Depot. And he asked me to join at Home Depot doing largely what I had done at GE, which was M&A. And we did that. And then uh, after about five or six years of doing that, um, Bob and the board came to a parting of the ways and the board asked me to be the CEO, uh, which was a shock to me. I would say I was singularly unprepared for the job. I never thought I would be the CEO of Home Depot. I never thought I'd be the CEO of anything. And so it was a rapid process of trying to figure out what leadership was like. You know, Home Depot, a large retailer at the time had 350 to 400,000 employees, so a very large enterprise. Um, and so I spent eight years as the CEO of Home Depot trying to learn about leadership. And then uh, since then, I've been on a number of corporate board, probably most direct interest to your listeners. I've been on some corporate boards. I'm on the Procter & Gamble board. I was, I've now rolled off. I was the chairman of the Delta board until this past June, uh, still on the Macy's board and and a couple of other boards, and that's what I've done. Okay. In a nutshell. Uh, Frank, amazing story. So, so much to talk about. So I want to go back to 1990. What was it that, that sparked? Because you had a successful career in a law practice at that time, and you had been in you know many high-profile administrations. You had some itch that said, I want to do something different. Talk to us a little bit about that. So, so I, yeah, and I tell people, which actually is true on, from a salary basis, I never made as much as I made as a lawyer in my law firm. Uh, I, you know, the benefit was getting equity in companies I was involved in, but from a salary basis, it was a step down. Uh, Washington's a, Washington's an odd place. And it was odd in 1990. It is exponentially odder now. And I didn't, after a certain point, I said, gee, I would like to do something different. And it may not be an obvious thing, but for me, it was, so So you need to imagine the when I moved to Schenectady, so the offices that I had there's a funny story around our offices uh, with this law firm that I and some uh, have a dozen other people uh, founded. But we we had this gorgeous view of the Potomac River. We had um, you know so much marble died for our offices. It was just spectacular offices. And when I moved to Schenectady, my office was literally at the back of a warehouse, and my wall would uh, vibrate when the when the forklift trucks would hit it. But there was a reality to it um, that actually I, it was just a very grounded, boy, this is this is a manufacturing business. You go in and look at where the steam turbines were made, where the generators were made. And I wanted that kind of experience. Yeah. So I got okay. it. Okay. Okay. Great. So there was this drive for you to get a little more, I don't know, I don't know if it's on the ground floor or. Yeah, really real world. Get, this real, real world, world. Just Washington with what's, is a what's very really, yeah. Washington's a. I, I, we could spend a lot of time talking about how. <laughs> That's a whole Washington. other show. That's Maybe a, a whole couple other shows. Show. Maybe a podcast. Yeah, all by itself. it's an interesting <laughs> too. It's interesting too in terms of the different leadership lessons, private sector and public sector. But a whole other show. Okay, so well, let's pivot then because you're right. That could be a whole other show. Yeah. All right. So so then this moment comes. Bob Nardelli, the board, they decide they're going to part. The board says, yeah. Frank, yeah. you're the guy. Yeah. Uh, all right. So now I want to go back into time. And you think about the first six months in that role as CEO. What were some of your key priorities, if you can remember? What were some of the things you really tried to do to onboard as a new CEO, given where Home Depot was at that time? Right. 
So to set a little context, first off, um, as I said, I wasn't thinking that I was going to be the CEO. And the same comment could be made for the other 350,000 people at Home Depot. They had <laughs> no clue who I was, what I was about, what they knew of me was not very positive, which is I didn't have a lot of retail experience. I was from GE and I was from a lawyer and I was a lawyer. So those are kind of three big strikes. And um, I knew enough, having worked in the company for uh, five or six years before that, I knew I had visions of what needed to change. Um, and uh one of the stories I tell, it's a, it's a true, uh, it happens to be true, is so I'm, I'm truly, when the nanosecond before the board called, I had never thought about being the CEO of Home Depot. And in fact, my first comment to the board was, you need to spend a day thinking about this, and I need to spend a day thinking about it, because you might want to get someone with more retail experience than I, or you should think about getting someone with more retail experience than I, and I got to think about whether I can do this job. Obviously, we both decided to go forward. But my son uh, worked in the company at that time. Uh, the company had a program for returning military veterans. He had served in Iraq and he had started out in Colorado, assistant store manager, et cetera, moved up and was running a store in Wilmington, North Carolina. So I gave him a call. This is a long winded answer. Sorry, Brandon, to your question. But I gave him a call and I said, Frank, you know, I got to get on the, you know, we have an internal communications vehicle in the company. I got to get on the TV and uh, talk to our associates. What do you think they're interested in saying? And first off, he couldn't believe that I was going to be the CEO. I had been sure and many times, yep, no, that's actually, this isn't a prank call. This is true. Um, and he said, well, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you how I start my weekly store meetings. And I said, great. How do you do it? He said, I read from the book Built from Scratch, which was written by Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank about the founding of Home Depot. And I said, that's brilliant. I want to do that. It's a great way of establishing one of the things that's important to me, which is to return to some of the culture of the company that Bernie and Arthur founded. And so I read, I'm reading through the book, what's an appropriate way to start? And there's a chapter in the book about the inverted pyramid where the CEO is at the bottom of the pyramid and the customer and frontline associates are at the top. And I said, that's important and uh, I'm going to talk about it. And so I did. And for the next eight years, uh, I tried to lead the company from that perspective and learn what it means because it's a very... It's very easy to kind of slough off the inverted pyramid and say, well, you know, nice statement of, you know, humility and servant leadership. But I actually think it is one of the most profound constructs for thinking about business and thinking about leadership that exists. And as I say, I spent eight years thinking about it. Yeah. So, Frank, I've got another question for you. And then I want to open yeah. up to just general leadership lessons that you had. So I'm curious, part of what I'm hearing in your story underpinning what made you so successful and effective was actually the fact you didn't know as much about the business. So it puts you in a position of being curious, of being humble. So here's my question to you. And, and I'm, I'm just curious, again, there's no right or wrong answer to this right. other than what you say. How much do you think is, how valuable is it for a CEO to kind of have a master of, a mastery of that industry, of the business? Versus a CEO that maybe has really strong leadership skills as an executive, but maybe doesn't know as much. So they're, they're in more of that, that position of learner or, or, uh, or novice. So I'm, I'm, I'm not that you were necessarily a novice. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I got I, it. I, I'd be I curious. What do you, where, where do you land on that? What do you think? So, so, so let me answer it by um, referencing what I think I learned about the inverted pyramid and why uh, I behave the way I did and why I think whether you know the industry you're in or not is actually um, not that significant because um, so so I'll give a really quick summary. Uh, once you visualize that you as the CEO are at the bottom of this organization at the, 
and not the top, you realize pretty quickly several things. The first is everything you're doing is uphill. Gravity is not your friend. When I hear about leaders, whether CEOs or heads of functions or whatever, when I hear about people thinking that <coughs> excuse me, communication cascades down to the organization, I know right off they don't understand because actually organizations really don't care what the boss has to say other other than how it directly impacts their work. And, and gravity is not your friend. You're working against gravity. And that puts a premium on how you communicate, the simplicity of your communication, and how your communication has a theme that can be seen by everybody above as something in their interest that they move forward and communications moved by osmosis and hard work up to an organization. Second, you understand how important listening is because everything that's important is happening at several removes from you. And if you don't understand how organizations work, you know, the, one of the important things to understand is organizations are not structured to provide robust information to their leaders. In fact, Organizations are structured to prevent that flow of, organ of, of information, particularly bad information. And so my view, uh, I think, Brandon, you're right in that uh, it came naturally to me to ask lots of questions because I didn't know much. But as I came to learn, even when you know something, what you know is yesterday. You don't know today. You don't know where things are going to tomorrow, tomorrow. And very often, you know, if you get somebody and you say, gosh, this is great because I've got somebody who worked, you know, he or she was in the store or a merchant or in supply chain and they've been doing it for 20 years. I will bet dimes to donuts that that person is working off a vision of their area. It was true 20 years ago, but isn't true now. And if they haven't taken the time to constantly refresh themselves and understand that as they grow in leadership, they're shrinking in terms of their positioning in the organization. So it really doesn't matter whether you start with expertise or not. The imperative is the same to understand what's actually going on in the ground as you're leading. It helps. I mean, honest, you know, look, I, I would not have had to work quite so hard if I had come in with some knowledge that I didn't have. But that sense of understanding the limits of your knowledge and the limits of your expertise, the importance of your team and the importance of the knowledge of your team and the importance ultimately of the customer, where the customer is, uh, I think is absolutely essential. So, Frank, masterful answer uh, uh, and, and so many rich nuggets in there. I want to go back to the first point you made around the inverted pyramid, right. because I think that is a very important kind of mind blowing idea for most leaders. They think communication trickles down. Right. They think culture trickles down. And yeah, I love your point. It's uphill. Gravity's not your friend. And, right. and, and in your business, being so customer facing, culture was really important. So what were some of the mechanisms or mechanics you and the rest of the senior team really try to be intentional about to reinforce, promote, feed culture across the whole system? So so I will say the most uh, interesting unlock for me, uh, and again, came from thinking about how you lead in an inverted pyramid world and how you get people to understand what it is that you want them to do. Uh, the, the most important thing a leader does is recognize and celebrate and tell stories around the people who are doing what he or she wants them to do. So if I send out a memo saying, 
we're all about customer service and here's our wonderful four blocker around customer service or whatever the memo is that I've sent out on customer service. Odds are no one's going to care. In fact, you know, my, I always used to joke, if you walked into a store at Home Depot, and this is, you can generalize this. If I asked the store manager how things were going, the only, there's only one right answer to that within a corporation, which is everything's going great, sir. You are wonderful. Please leave. So you have to get past that and you have to be able to express what it is that you want. The single best thing for me was um, we had an incredibly intentional uh, and, you know, just very, um, you know, all every day, every week, pulling out examples of customer service and celebrating. So customer service was a big thing we were driving. So uh, to give an example, this was very structured. Every store would send in examples of great customer service. They would go to a district. The district would send their best to the regional vice president. Regional vice presidents would send them to me. And I would literally spend half a day on Sunday writing personal notes, thanking hourly associates and others for great customer service. And they were specific notes. So they told the story, dear Joe or Jane, I heard you did the following with respect to, you know, some customer effort. And that's great. I love you, Frank. Here's 50 bucks. And those, and I, frankly, I learned this from George Bush dad, that power of personally reaching out and saying, here's your story that is great within what we're trying to do is so much easier for everyone to understand. In any company memo. And we used to, so I'd send out these notes. Um, we would put books out of, I mean, literally print a book of great customer service. Uh, Marvin Allison, who was running stores for us at the time and who's now running Lowe's, mm-hmm. would do this on our weekly broadcast. Highlight Associates, who did great, great things. I mean, I have many, many examples but they were all built around recognizing and celebrating people who are doing what it is you want them to do. And for me, when you think about it in a company, you know, any company more than 10 people, uh, if you ask what the, if you ask the employees, what does your boss want you to do? Uh, they actually are pretty fuzzy about it. And, you know, they may, They may know the metrics that they've got to hit, but what does the boss want to see as your activity set is pretty fuzzy. And the best way to make it not fuzzy is to tell a story right. Hmm. And recognize and celebrate the person, literally or figuratively, bring that person up to the stage. You say, you know what great looks like in our company? This is what great looks like. And everybody in the audience is going, first off, I remember the story. Because, you know, stories are memorable. And second, they go, well, gosh, I do that every day. You know, Frank and the team got to understand that I do that. And you start telling your own story of what makes you who you are. And that's what reinforces first the alignment around where you're going. And second, it's the culture that you're actually wanting to build rather than some random culture that's filling in in the vacuum. And whenever you leave that vacuum, it tends to get filled in by nuts of good, nuts of good stuff. Frank, fantastic. So let's just, I'm going to open it up nice and broad when, and then we'll, we'll start to move our, move to landing our plane. So when you think about your tenure at Home Depot, and it can be even be beyond this, what were some of the other big leadership lessons? that you learned along the way that you think leaders today would be well served to kind of yeah. keep in the, keep in their back pocket. So, so I tell new CEOs that uh, they need to get, and this is probably true in lots of different jobs. They need to get two things right to succeed. And if they get these right, they're going to be successful. If they get them wrong, they can get a lot of other things right. And it's not going to, uh, you need to get your capital allocation, right? You know, where are you putting your financial resources? And you need to get your human resources right. Where are you putting your people? Sounds simple, incredibly difficult to do. 
So on capital allocation, resource allocation, my belief is that most people in most companies want to keep the allocation of resources plus or minus 5%. That's it. They just, and they're trying to create the guardrails that keep the leadership within that plus or minus 5% because life is a whole lot easier if you're just dealing with plus or minus 5%. You don't achieve anything with plus or minus 5%. Mm -hmm. If you actually have a vision for where you want to move your organization, and if that vision does not imply a significant reallocation of your resources, you are not actually changing the direction of your organization. And changing resource allocation by more than 5 or 10% is incredibly stressful for a business, but that's your job. You got to be doing that. You got to figure out the right things. Your success or failure will be determined by, did you figure out the right things to lean into and lean away from? Similarly with people, you know, it's everybody knows that, uh, you know, people are your most important asset, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but having said all that, people don't behave that way. Uh, I, make this comment to every group of CEOs that I meet with. I say, I will make you a hundred dollar bet now that I can guarantee you I will win. And the hundred dollar bet is that when I come back and you're retired and you're old as dirt like I am, and somebody asks you, what's your regret? You're going to say your regret was not moving quickly enough. Home. I know it. You know it. You still won't do it. Think about it. Yeah. And and it's it's really difficult uh, because we want to act with respect and ethically with all the people who work with us, and I think that's hugely important. But at the same time, I so I tell this story. Sorry, I'm bouncing around, but I tell this story that when I became CEO of Home Depot, I called up Jack Welch and I said, Jack, I need some CEO 101 stuff. This is, I, and he was very gracious. And uh, I flew down to Florida and spent a day with him in, in February. Now, and I had just been named a CEO in January. Now, mind you, I had made presentations. I made hundreds of presentations with Jack. And I was so prepared for this first meeting with Welch. I knew every number, backwards and forwards, because that's what I thought we were going to talk about. Not what we talked about at all. He said, okay, I want you to start by drawing your organization chart for me. I want you to talk about those people. And then I want you to talk to me about what are your biggest issues. And then we're going to talk about how those people that you've got match up against your biggest issues. Are you actually putting your re human resources where you are describing your number one issue? And honestly, I had heard Jack talk about the importance of people and all the rest of it, but I all I saw was more the financial and hard-driven operations side. But going through that exercise was such an eye-opener for me. Um, it was like, oh God, yeah, all right. That I mean, and when you say it, you go, yes, of course. That makes total sense. But I can't tell you the number of organizations that don't do that. That if you ask the CEO, if you had two different conversations with the CEO. And you said to him or her, what's, what are the most important things you got to do? And they go, blah, 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 blah. They'll have their priorities. And now they go, okay, now, who are your best people? And they go, how, how, how are we, how do those things match? It's fascinating. The fascinating exercise. It was, it was compelling for me. I, I think that's brilliant because, you know, the business might be going, as you've said, you know, yesterday's news is yesterday's news and the business changes right. what matters. I I love the analogy of, I wear glasses. I've worn glasses since I was in third grade, Frank. Uh, so I'm used to, I'm supposed to go see the optometrist every year to get my eyes right. checked. I don't do that. I go about every three years, but I think that's about how often businesses should re-examine culture, about right. every three years because right. the marketplace changes. So you may yeah. all of a sudden have a need where compliance or regulatory is a big deal. And you don't really have anybody on your team that's a master no. at that area. Yep. So just by doing that exercise, I might say, you know, we should go out and get somebody who's that's, an expert on this because yep. that's a that's a need in the business. Or, or we got to do somebody to help something to help this guy or gal get more up to speed. 
I mean, there are lots of different answers, but you can't come up with the answer until you understand what the question of problem. Yeah. Now, is that you went? You mentioned also that the cap, capital allocation, yeah, really challenging to go beyond that five percent. Right. Right. In, in, and I'm assuming that's because some things you're going to lean away from. So you're, you're, you're telling folks you're not going to have as much resources as you used to because we're redeploying it over here. Totally. Is, it, is that what makes it why, totally. why it's so hard? Totally. Yeah. totally. So, so first off, I, you know, I mentioned I worked in government and one of the things, I mean, one of the things I learned from government bureaucracies that's also true of business bureaucracies is they hate change. You just hate change. I mean, almost before you ask, am I a winner or a loser in this thing? You go, is it a big change? Even if you're giving me a ton more money, I'm not thrilled by that either because I've got a lot of new expectations on me and I'm not sure I agree with all these new expectations. It is the chain that is the fear. And again, in my opinion, organizations I, I, I just, organizations exist to work change. That's what they're there for. And, you know, it's, it's the, it's, if you think about business writ large, every successful business is a successful business because it was brilliant at solving some customer problem. And then as they grow, they become much more interested in their own problem than the customer problem. They spend a hell of a lot more time talking about their own internal budgeting, their own, you know, what the days for life soap opera and the customer gets lost and that's not that's actually a pretty common thing yeah i'm not describing kind of a one-off god that never happens i'm describing this is an arc that it impacts every single business that every single leader has to be fighting about and fighting against all the time so Frank, uh, we're going to start to move to move to landing our plane. I, I hate to do it because it feels like we're just getting started. But one thing I do want to call out, we'd had a prior conversation and you gave me this golden nugget that I've been sharing with clients since. And the golden nugget is, the, the, I want to paraphrase you. You said great leaders and leadership teams, they, they pull complexity up, push simplicity down. Not so effective ones do the opposite. They pull right. simplicity up, push complexity down. I think that's masterful, brilliant, and difficult to do. Would love to get maybe uh, a few thoughts uh, from you on that concept before we officially start to close. Yeah, so so uh, I'm glad you picked up on that, Brandon, because I think it's hugely important. I think uh, almost all leaders know that complexity kills momentum and that complexity is not a good thing. So everybody starts from the same line. I want to make things simple. Then you get to what that means. And there are some C-suites for whom simple, making things simple means it's simple around our table. We can express, here are the simple things we want everybody doing. Now, underneath it, you know, there are all kinds of complexities and trade-offs, but we don't want to get into that. The field will deal with that. Well, all you've done when you've done that is you've absorbed simplicity up as the leadership team. Here's our nice statement of values and all the rest. And all the complexity, all those trade-offs, all the difficulties, we've just pushed down to the organization. In my opinion, the right way for an organization to behave, a leadership team to behave, is they need to absorb the complexity up and push simplicity down, by which I mean the leadership team needs to be wrestling with the trade-offs. So to take an easy retail example, uh, retailers, particularly now, are worried about shrink, theft in store. So there are a, theory, a series of things you can do in a store that will reduce theft, shrink. Those tend not to be very customer-friendly. So if I just say, uh, you know, here's my simple statement as the leader. I, you know, want a great store experience and I want as little theft as possible. All right. That sounds simple. But for the store manager, I've got no idea what that has made it simple. That's actually made it more complicated because I know 
They're going to hold me accountable for achieving something unique on theft and customer experience. And those two things require trade-off. Far better for the team, leadership team, to sit around the table and say, this is the amount of risk we're willing to absorb. We're going to take some of that complexity off the table. I mean, we're not going to eliminate it entirely, but we're going to take some of that complexity off the table for the store manager and say, here, as you know, this is what we mean. We're willing to tolerate your letting loose of the rope on theft or you're letting the loose of the rope on customer service, whatever it is, to this extent. That has made things simpler. Operation. We would talk about, uh, you know, anyway, uh, that's the simple example. But to my mind, if a leadership team is talking about making things simple, and if they haven't spent a lot of time actually wrestling with the trade offs and coming up with the answers to the trade offs, they have not made things simple. They've just pushed the complexity down the organization. Frank, this has been an absolute joy and gift. So I ask all my guests this question as we kind of end our time together. Any one practical tip that you would recommend to leaders today, something they can start doing tomorrow that will help them be more effective, help help support their teams even better in the climate we're in? So uh, again, I'm going to reference back to the inverted pyramid and say that one of the core skill sets for a leader is how you ask questions. and my uh, hack on that is do not ask yes or no questions. Never mm-hmm. ask yes or no questions. They're too easy. Ask instead. I had two questions that I would ask um, that were actually very helpful in finding out what the heck's going on. First, I would try to ask things on a scale. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how is X going? And the beauty of that is no one's going to say 1. No one's going to say 10. Everybody's going to, you know, we're all conditioned to how you do the right answer. And the answer will be somewhere between seven or eight or something like that. But gives you an opportunity to ask, okay, what would make this a nine? How do I improve it? So you have a genuine conversation. It opens the possibility for a genuine conversation. That's one. The second I learned from one of my board members, um, and that was whatever the project is, uh, the question is, why isn't this project going? Now, I have no idea whether the project's going well or not. I don't know a damn thing about how the project's going. But if I say to someone, why isn't this going well? They're going to assume I know something. And they're going to say, well, the project's not going well because of blah, 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 blah. And I will have found something out. And every once in a while, they'll say, why do you say that? The project's great, which is fine. You leave it. But nine out of 10 times, they're going to say, well, it's not going as well as it should because. And you've actually found out something. You've actually touched. And I mean, you're searching after touching some truths within your organization and being able to respond to those. Be careful that you're not searching for validation. And more leaders ask self-validating questions than truth-seeking. What And so a great way to summarize a lot of the big themes that you've shared with us, Frank, this whole idea that we often think organizations, it's a natural flow. And you reframe that for us that no, actually, they're built to resist change. Over time, they get they get uh, insular and focus on their own problems, not customer problems. And they're built to deliver um, not all the good, all the bad news uh, and limited bad news uh, up. So if you, yep. uh, or in the case of the pyramid, down, and yep. and if we really want to get there, we're going to have to find other ways to learn that information. Uh, Frank, that's a great joy. summary. And I'd say, how many people think their career is made by delivering bad news? Yeah. Not many. Right, right. And and I think there's a lot of leaders right now that are waiting. They're sitting at the top. They're, they've made arrived a C-suite, and they're waiting for information to come to them. Right. They're waiting for these things to flow. And, it's, and you're reminding us or enlightening us. It's not going to work that way. Right, uh, Frank. Yeah. This was great. Thank you so much for no, thank you, Brandon. not only the gift of your time, but the gift of your wisdom, your experience, your insights, uh, and your success. 
So we really, really, really appreciate it. Um, so thank you again. And, and, and this was great. And, and if you're open to it, would love to have you back on at some point. Well, it's a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you very much. I love my conversation with Frank. I've got so many notes. We can't review all of them today, but I do want to pull out a couple highlights that I think are so valuable for us as leaders. So first he said, you have to understand the inverted pyramid. You've got to understand that the CEO, the senior team are at the bottom. And he says, everything's uphill. So gravity is, is working against you. Communication does not cascade. I think that's really important. You've got to push more. And he talked about how he does that. He talks about um, listening to and telling stories. Uh, I'll share a little bit more about that in a minute. Then he talked about listening. It's so important as, as a new leader. You've got to be able to listen, get out there and ask good questions. He even ended our conversation with the power of asking the right questions to truly understand what's going on. And then we had some time talking about being humble and being in that state of learner all the time versus master. And, and going through and asking questions to learn more about the business. Frank was exceptional at that, and you can tell how much he believes in it. And then we also spent some time talking about culture, because I know that's something that's very challenging for senior teams. And Frank said it really goes down to identifying those folks that are doing the things that you want them to be doing. Celebrate those, recognize them, tell stories. He even talks about how every week the stories would bubble all the way up to him, and every Sunday he'd hand write notes to thank those folks who are out in the field doing the things that they want to see done more often. And in his case, it was customer service, but really creating and promoting that culture of customer service. Uh, again, I've got so many notes. I know you've got notes as well, things that stood out for you, regardless of what you took away, identify that maybe one thing or, or the two things you either want to start doing, stop doing, or continue doing. If you can come away with that and start doing it tomorrow, not only is it going to benefit your teams, it's going to make you a better leader. 